Okay, uh, we'll get started. Um, welcome, everybody. This is a uh, this is a special meeting, uh, membership meeting, for the purpose of discussing the SGR cap. Um, I think our last meeting on this topic was in this in this early springtime, and um, we're going to pick it up again today. Uh, the agenda is listed if you have had a chance to look at it. Um, we'll, uh, Sarah Absher is going to be facilitating really the meeting. I, uh, I'm going to do the try and monitor the chat and interject questions when I can uh, of Sarah. So, um, so my name is Mark Everett. I'm the chair of the NCAC and uh, welcome again. We, uh, one of the pieces of business we have to do is do a conflict of interest for the officers and there are four of us. So uh, I have no conflict of interest this evening. Um, we'll just go, Gary. Uh, actually, I do have a conflict of interest on this subject. Uh, I'm one of several interveners on behalf of Tillamook County regarding litigation around the recent changes to Ordinance 84. Uh, so for that reason, I'm not handling the uh, hosting duties for this meeting as I, as I would normally have been for uh, secretary. So uh, for this meeting, I'm participating strictly as a regular member. Okay. Thanks, this is Gary. Michael Beachley. I'm the parliamentarian. I have no conflicts of interest. Thanks, Michael. Uh, this is Alex Clark. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. This is Chris Tokowski. I have no conflicts of interest. Okay. Thank you. Um, those are the four officers and parliamentarian. And the other introduction is Sarah Absher, uh, a uh, leader of the community development um, uh, program in Tillamook County. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Mark. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. And Sarah, just a before you get started, I think if I'm remembering last time we did this, I kind of I'll try and monitor the chat and when there's a pause or try and interject a, a question if I can. Um, if there's a time to to pose that of you, um, and we'll just do that throughout the evening if if, that, if that's okay. That sounds great. Absolutely okay. yes. So okay. I will um, share information. I'm not. I'm okay. going to keep my chat closed. Um, okay. And then, uh, yeah, just, just, yeah, please interject if, if there's a question at that time. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. And I'll just, we'll turn it over to you. This is your second or third probably on this topic. So uh, yes. you, you've done this in a couple of places. So it's all yours. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for jumping online tonight for this conversation. Uh, this is a continuation of a conversation that we had regarding Nescoin's short-term rental license cap uh, that took place earlier this year. Uh, just a quick recap maybe for those that are joining us tonight that were not at that last meeting. Um, the meeting was called uh, because following the lifting of the pause, in 2023 and um, adoption of the board order that establishes caps or limits on the number of short-term rental licenses for Nescoin and 20 other sub areas that are largely UGBs and unincorporated communities across Tillamook County. There was a conversation that I had with the short-term rental advisory committee and the board of county commissioners during the ordinance amendment proceedings in the summer of 2023 that talked about coming back to communities and revisiting the caps that were passed in that board order in 2023 to see uh, how communities felt about the caps, um, get some feedback on the caps in terms of are they at a level right now that the community finds are acceptable? Is the cap too high? Is the cap too low? Uh, so we had a lot of conversations about that at our previous meeting, along with kind of a walkthrough of program updates for our short-term rental program. Tillamook County short-term rental program is not regulated through the county's land use program. So we all know it's a separate ordinance that governs uh, short-term rentals and um, separate licensing process. 
So at the end of the last meeting, which took place, I think, in the earlier part of the summer, super late spring, we were talking about um, waiting until after summer was over to revisit the conversation. Nesquan has done an incredible job with public outreach and engagement for all of the things that you guys are working on. And we prioritize some of the other land use pieces with community plan and middle housing um, through the summer. And then now summer's over. So here we are to wrap up the conversation this year about the short-term rental cap. Um, when, when we left the last meeting, we did kind of an informal straw poll and the majority of the folks that attended that last meeting felt that as the new program updates continued to play out this year, um, that perhaps a wait and see approach to give it another year with the existing cap, with the number of short-term rental licenses for Nesco in, to see how another year played out and then come back and revisit the conversation. So when we left the conversation at the last meeting, it was the wait and see um, option that's, that seemed to garner the most support. <clears throat> so I'm back tonight. I'd like to share some updates with you. I have some data that uh, I think you're interested in knowing more about um, and then uh, answer any questions you guys have about the program and then wrap up the conversation tonight with a request of, you know, does the community still feel the majority that giving this program another year as it has been amended and updated, see what happens over the course of this next year and then come back early 2026 to talk about whether or not we should look at a cap adjustment. Um, <clears throat> so any questions so far about what happened at the last meeting and what we're talking about tonight? Just want to make sure we're all we're all together in this. Anything, Mark? We good? No. Yep, okay. No questions. Yep. All right. Okay. So let's talk about where we're at. So the board order <clears throat> that was adopted by the Board of County Commissioners to establish the caps. So that board order um, was signed early August 2023. <clears throat> and in Nesco with the lifting of the pause, um, what it did was it brought your number of licenses up 11 licenses. So when the pause went into effect in July of 2022 to when the pause was lifted in, I believe it was October of 2023, what the board had authorized was 11 additional licenses that could be issued for the community of Nesquin. And what we did as reflected in this board order was we held a program resumption lottery. So to date, we have continued to work through the program. We have issued those 11 licenses. So Nesquin was one of three communities that ended up with a wait list when the program resumption lottery occurred in October of 2023 there were three communities that had wait lists. There was Neocani, there was Nescoan, and there was Pacific City. Currently, your wait list has 10 folks on it. So there are 10 people on the wait list for Nescoan. And the wait list is actually um, published on the DCD page. So if you go to the community development homepage, click on the link on the left-hand side, for short-term rental slash lodging, you will see a blue tab that says STR waitlist and form. And if you click on that, you will see then a, an access to a list for all of the communities to date that have a waitlist. So Nescoan has 10 on the waitlist. Um, so then a couple of the other things on the board order, one thing that I need to do is go back to the Board of County Commissioners next month to amend and update this board order. Um, not the ordinance, the ordinance that contains the regulations for the short-term rental program is not being touched right now. And largely that's because we are still going through those program updates. Um, it is no secret, the county is also still in the midst of litigation over the program changes that were made. 
So we are not touching the ordinance. Um, but what I do have to do is amend that board order because, you know, the things that were in the order that are in the order for this year include the steps for the program resumption lottery and other things. So that's a good question, Harvey. I'm going to get to that in just a sec. So um, with that, the question tonight again, as we approach the end of this conversation this evening is, does the community still support, and I get a consensus on wait and see for another year to continue to allow these program updates to uh, come to fruition and, and we see the work that is continuing to happen. Um, so currently in Neskowin, Neskowin has reached its allotment for 191 short-term rental licenses. You are hovering right at around 21%, which is what is reflected in the order. Um, you have of those 78 of those licenses are in the condominiums. So in case anybody wants to know what that is. Um, one of the conversations that we had at the last uh, meeting was to consider exempting the condominiums from the cap. Um, after further conversation with that, it is an uh, option that I am definitely happy to present to the Board of County Commissioners when I provide them with a summary of the conversation this evening. So I will be part of what I need to do is collect your feedback and send that with my board order to the Board of County Commissioners. It'll happen next month. Um, there are some concerns about adjusting the order to exempt the condos. One of the conversations that did occur um, during our meeting last time was acknowledgement that some of those condominium units, they are not all within the commercial area of Nesco and some of those extend out into the village residential area itself. And so I think that was one of the reasons some folks were on the fence about that. And that's where the wait and see approach garnered the most support in our last meeting. But I was asked how many of those licenses belong to condo units. And the answer to that is 78. So just so y'all know. Okay, so moving on. Um, so what's been happening this year? A couple of things that we have been working on, uh, primarily the um, complaint hotline is something else um, that went into effect last October. I've got some numbers for you on that. Uh, one of the things that I also have been doing, um, so the short-term rental license renewal process has been extensive. I will say that it has been extensive for owners and operators. Um, I want to thank everyone for their work in getting us what we need to renew your licenses. Um, we, it is a process that will be completed by the end of the year. We are taking our time to make sure that our review of things like parking, bedrooms, occupancy maximums, are as accurate as we can determine based on the information provided by the owners and managers and also based on the information in county records, specifically site plans that show where property boundaries are, things like um, also looking at where driveways are, right? Because some of the biggest concerns in terms of livability issues and conflicts that we heard during the update <clears throat> process were largely related to parking, traffic, congestion, noise, and trash, right? So wanting to make sure that we are, are doing our work in, in helping to be responsible and accurate in our review to help address these issues through appropriate licensing review. Um, so I have some numbers for you. We are we are returning at about three quarters of the way through the year with license renewals. Um, May and June were our biggest um, time of renewal of applications. Most of the applications that we have renewed 
are reviewed for renewal initially started with their initial application in May and June, whether it was year 2010, 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. And I think that's largely because, um, you know, people, when they initially applied for a license, whatever year they applied, it was in preparation of renting through those summer months. So everything rolls through renewal on an anniversary month. So the renewal process hasn't started with every single license in January of 2024. The licenses that have come under renewal review in January were only those licenses that were initially issued in January of whatever year they began. Same thing, February, February March, April, May, et cetera. So um, as you are aware, when the pause was getting ready to go into effect, May and June of 2022, the department had a massive influx of license applications or initial applications. So um, that alone increased the number of licenses that needed to be reviewed during this renewal process. Um, so we are wrapping up most of the summer license renewal processes now. Uh, with that, the online registry online gets updated bi-weekly. So you can go online. On the online registry, it includes the contact name and um, number for the person responsible for the rental. And you will see in the columns the maximum occupancy and the required parking for each rental. So we are updating that um, spreadsheet, that registry online, as we work through the renewals. Some renewals for licenses are taking longer than others. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are doing our best to work with folks for their license renewals. Um, we understand some of them are taking a bit more time than others. That is primarily due to if they are also required to have a fire and life safety inspection this year and whether or not a follow-up inspection is required or if the license holder is required to obtain on-street parking verification. So both of those extra steps can take a little bit more time. So process is definitely not turnkey, but we feel like, um, you know, we appreciate the owners and the operators with the work that they're doing to get us information. And we feel like we are doing good work in the office in terms of accuracy and, and really paying close attention to parking and occupancy limits. So Sarah, as a, yes. Can I, can I mm -hmm. just, I got just two questions sure. and then I'll turn it back over to you. The first one is from Harvey uh, Rubenstein mm -hmm. and you've answered it, but he asked yeah. how many total STRs yeah. are in Nesquin. So it's 191 Correct. STRs and 78 are, in, are at in the condos. Correct. 78. Okay. And then, the second question I see is from Roxolana, um, mm -hmm. and she says, I've applied for wait list and still haven't been added to it. I have a condo at Pacific Sands Resort. Uh, I've contacted the department a few times and even stopped by to drop in the application and haven't, I think, means I haven't got any answers. I maybe haven't received any communication. Who do I With get? Who do? Oh, go ahead. So, okay, let me, yeah. so as far as I okay. know, the wait list is current. The folks okay. do not go on the wait list until the wait list fee has been paid, but okay. I am going to put Lynn's email okay. in here. So Lynn is the staff person that helps me with the program. And I'm also going to put our phone number because what I would love is if you want to give me a call, and let me know, confirm the address and the name. I would love to follow up on that tomorrow. Okay. Roxolana says she's dropped the payment as well, but thank you. And uh, I think she'll probably be in contact with yeah, you. Yeah, please do. Yes. Okay. Okay. And that's that's all I see. Is so that it so yeah, far? So, okay. Yep. So let's talk about those reviews um, and what has happened. So... Um, <laughs> We have been, so what I can say for confirmed reviews of the licenses that have been reviewed to date for Nescoin, um, maximum occupancy 
Um, so the total number of licenses that we have reviewed, we started that have been completed. So these are renewals that have been completely processed. Um, maximum occupancy has been reduced by 23 guests. Um, and much of that is related to the estate home definition that now limits guest maximum occupancy to 14. Um, and there's also a few in there where the occupancy was lowered because of um, the balance with available parking spaces, right? So we start with the number of bedrooms to determine guest occupancy, but then the number of parking spaces is a one-to-one -one ratio with the bedroom. So if you have fewer parking spaces than bedrooms, the occupancy will be adjusted down to the total number of parking spaces. So it's so that it's a one-to-one -one ratio of parking space and bedroom. We did have a few rentals in Nescoin where the occupancy actually went up for the same reason. Um, what I have seen, I have been reviewing every license before it's issued for 2024, 2025. What I would also offer to the community is that there are several homeowners who, even though they could have a higher guest occupancy limit, they actually voluntarily choose to keep it at a lower number. So we actually have quite a few owners and operators that are not filling their homes to the number of guests that could actually be allowed. Um, with that, so parking, I'm still working out the parking numbers. I did give the board an update. I was very excited. I got some preliminary numbers from my staff. I went back through and reviewed them. Um, there were some uh, addresses and locations grouped in Donesco and that actually didn't belong in Donesco. But what I can confirm is that with the parking spaces allowed, we have actually reduced the overall number of parking spaces for STRs by 36. And the majority of those were in the village. And what I'll say to the parking spaces is I think there's two reasons why those numbers have been reduced. And I will have final numbers at the end of the year. So these numbers, this is not a static, these are not static numbers. These numbers are shifting because we are continuing actively to do renewals. So two reasons why I think we've seen those reductions. One, we added specificity to the dimension that is required for a parking space. So before there was not a dimension in the ordinance for how big a parking, each parking space needed to be. So now we have a dimension. Um, the other factor is that I really think that a lot of folks just genuinely have not known where their property boundaries were. And so what we've done is we've seen adjustments where we've had some folks that I think that assume because the vehicle was off of the travel surface of the road, that their property line potentially went up to the paved surface of the road, which is not the case. Most of your roads in Nescoin are, I think the average is like 40 feet wide for road right of way. And somewhere within that right of way is the paved travel surface or gravel surface that we all drive down. And so, um, there's been a lot of work with folks to help them better identify where their property boundaries are. And because parking is required to be off street, parking spaces and the numbers have been adjusted based on where we've been able to locate property lines. Uh, Public Works has been busy doing on street parking verifications. They are doing them countywide. Um, one of the things that I would say with that is we are seeing a lot of cars getting off the road through the on-street parking verification because it's been an opportunity to intentionally determine with transportation engineering support where the best place is for cars to park with that up to two parking vehicle spaces allowed on on-street parking. Um, and so... That process, uh, it has been taking a bit of time. The other thing we're seeing is owners doing a good job 
of being more thoughtful about creating uh, parking space and parking space av availability and pulling cars outside of the travel lane of our roads. So again, I wanna thank the owners and operators for that work and that partnership with Public Works because that's something that benefits everyone. So right now we have a reduction of 23 guests overall for maximum occupancy and parking. We have an overall reduction of 36 spaces. I expect both of those numbers to continue to adjust and shift. Uh, for those that are thinking about potential economic impacts as a result of fewer guests, I also just want to say that I have had a uh, preliminary conversation with Nan Devlin and also with Tom Stiber on my team that collects the transient lodging tax filings. So we recognize that there may be folks with concerns about the shifts in occupancy and how those may have an economic <laughs> impact in our county, and we are following that closely as well. But again, that's not something we're going to fully see or realize for at least another year because we're still going through the updates of this program. So Sarah, I'll stop right there. Yep. Go ahead, Mark. Two, two questions. Uh, Michael Michael Beachley mm -hmm. uh, said, when appropriate, please ask Sarah to articulate the difference between keeping the hold on changes or moving to make the changes. In, in terms of licenses that are still under review? I don't see that question My, in the chat. Uh, yeah, Michael, do you wanna? Yeah, please elaborate. Articulate that, Michael. Well, uh, Sarah, hi, Sarah. Uh, hi, Michael. Good to see you. And, yeah, nice it's good to see you and thank you for coming. Um, you talked earlier about whether or not we should uh, maintain the uh, hold on mm -hmm. things and, and um, I know there's a lot of people here who don't understand the differences. I just thought you might want to clarify the history of that and what it means to uh, maintain that holder, what it would mean to, to uh, take it off and move forward. Okay. So are you talking about, thank you, Michael. Are you talking about the wait and see option? Yes, ma'am. Exactly. Great. Thank you. So the wait and see <laughs> option means that we don't touch the cap. We don't do anything for another year. We keep we propose to keep the license limits where they are. They don't go up. They don't go down. They stay where they're at so that the focus of this year and the coming year can be to really see with the numbers where they're at, have community livability concerns been addressed? Are they starting to get addressed? Are we seeing positive changes in terms of those concerns being mitigated or resolved? So that is so that is one of my questions tonight as we talk about me going to the Board of County Commissioners with the board order updates for the order that contains the caps is, you know, are is the community willing? to give this process and this program another year to maintain the status quo uh, with the number of licenses that are allowed to see if we are doing better at addressing and mitigating community livability concerns. So wait and see. So that um, the other option was we talked about, because there's a few, you know, is the community interested in seeing a higher cap, meaning we could issue more licenses for Nesco and is the community interested in a lower cap um, to where, you know, I would go to the board and say that the community uh, would like to see that percentage dropped, meaning the number of licenses dropped. So those pretty much are the options. I would say with the condos in or out, um, I'm not sure that would gain enough traction um, I think that based on the feedback that I've received, again, the majority of what I've heard has been, let's give it another year and just leave everything as it is. Um, with that, what I would say is that in that order, there's two pieces to it. There's a percentage and then there's a not to exceed number and that not to exceed number is 191 licenses. What the wait and see a option does also is we stay at 191 licenses. 
So even though that percentage could have fluctuated with additional homes being built in Neskowin over the last year, year and a half, even with that increase in numbers, we would not change the not to exceed number of 191. So wait and see, give it another year with the 191 license maximum. So does that answer your question, Michael? Yes, yeah, it helps to clarify, excuse me, clarify. But but I think, you know, when you get into the weeds, it has to do with an economic and um, um, uh, commercial issues for all of those folks who, um, uh, see this as you know part of their family business and so on. Mm -hmm. The other the other business has to do with community livability and the influx of uh, of folks coming in and out and so on. I mean it's deeper than just a cap That's uh, right. because yeah there are there are repercussions there are logical consequences and I, I think it's it's worthy for everybody before they vote and say hey I want this to happen or that to happen is to acquaint ourselves, all of us, on what any of those and all of those repercussions might be. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. And it's multifaceted. There's a lot, yeah. there's a lot of cause and effects with this. And because we are still working through the program updates, we haven't really seen the cause and effect of those updates because we're, you know, three quarters through the first year, you know. Um, I will tell you my thought as the administrator of the program is I would like to give it another year and carefully track what's happening, continue to talk to Nan Devlin, Tom Stiver, you know, get those reports, talk to communities, come back in a year and talk about, you know, how have things been? Of course, we talk regularly anyway, so I'm always open for, you know, that check in. But but to your point, yes, to fully wait and see before we change anything, what's happening with the changes that are already in place. Well, I thank you for that. And I think it's prudent to do so, that. It also gives people a chance to acquaint themselves with what the underlying issues really are and mm -hmm. what the repercussions are from whatever decision is being made. It's yeah. important to keep track of all that business. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Sarah, mm -hmm. Sarah had, uh, I two, see two more questions. questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You, you got oh, it. Okay. And, I, don't, and then Tom, I don't know. I don't yeah, know the answer okay. to that. I can find out, but I don't, I don't have them split up per condo development. Okay. You can okay. go on the online registry and see, I'm happy to get okay. back to you about that. Okay. And then he's got another one. Well, then Tom, Tom Berhodich has a question and Bill's got another one. So okay. Tom. Yeah, Sarah, the, I, I intend to talk later, but before we get to that, um, I hate to put you on the spot, it's okay. but uh, okay. having <clears throat> listened to similar meetings in Nia Connie and mm -hmm. in Oceanside, which you held in the last five days, <laughs> you went into some detail about the practical and political um, and legal uh reasons to put this off a little bit and i again i hate to put you on the spot no, but i okay. think as is, is we're as we're thinking through what we want to do uh that's important information because what the, what the county is thinking and what the county staff and the board are likely to do uh i think to a certain extent governs and probably constrains our decision making Sure, Tom. Absolutely. I'm happy to to dive into that. That was next on my list. Um, well, I helped you. You helped <laughs> me. Yeah, always, always. Thank you. Yeah. So a um, couple of things. One, I touched on this lightly in the beginning. We are still in the throes of litigation defending the program updates that have occurred. And part of, in, you know, one of the things that I have done as I've continued to talk to communities countywide is suggestions such as what if we postpone the lose it or use it or lose it till 2026? You know, can we, you know, create sub areas for different cap percentages? Um, you know, there have been various things that have come up in terms of lowering, reducing, um, changing or shifting or adjusting and you know talking to our 
team of county council because of all the litigation that continues to occur, you know, their recommendation is not to touch anything at this time. And we're still we're still defending the the changes that we made. Um, and making more changes may not be a good idea um, and could open us up and make us susceptible for more litigation. Litigation is expensive, you know, and that's that's money that's coming from the county that could be better spent elsewhere in terms of our resources and what we're trying to do for our communities. Um, with that, one thing that was not known at the time a year ago when we talked about revisiting the caps was the passing of the forest habitat conservation plan. And the reason why that is significant and related to the conversation we're having tonight <laughs> is because Tillamook County is one of the counties in Oregon that heavily relies on timber revenue, right? We get that tax revenue from timber harvesting and timber sales. And we, I don't know if you've seen, I don't know if you guys read the Headlight Herald or anything. Um, I know it's mostly central county paper, but there's actually an article in the paper this week that talks about budget committee meetings that have already started in preparation for next year. We are looking at significant budget shortfalls with the general fund. And we are already trying to figure out how to bridge those gaps to continue to provide the services we provide to our residents and our communities. And some of the numbers I've seen in recent documents that we've just what we've talked about at these meetings, we could be starting out next year potentially with a $2.7 million shortfall before we even turn our budgets in. So that's significant. And so we have already started working as a leadership team with the budget committee to develop strategies on how we are going to address these budget shortfalls so that we can continue to provide services. And there's roughly, I think, 50 some strategies right now that are on the table, so, you know, whatever anybody can think of. And one of the strategies that seems to be one of the most viable options is increasing the TLT percentage up potentially to 15, 16%. And what that would do is it would freeze what if it, and so you might be hearing more about this because this has to go back to the voters. Um, but what we would do is freeze the, the revenue that the Tillamook County Public Works Department is currently getting from that 30%, right? Because there's that 70, 30 split. And the increase from that TLT percentage of that 30% would go to public safety. The sheriff's office is requires the most financial support of the county budget. And patrol is not a state mandated service. The jail is, but patrol is not. And so part of the conversation is, is leaving the license numbers where they are at because over two thirds of the TLT revenue in unincorporated Tillamook County comes from short term rentals. If we start reducing caps in communities and we are trying to decrease the revenue shortfalls there could be a cause and effect that completely undermines those efforts to try to use TLT with that 30% to help bridge our funding gaps. So in addition to Michael's point about the cause and effect of the changes that are being made, I mean, just to be honest with everybody, we are exploring various strategies to help address the revenue shortfalls we know we are quickly going to face. So those are some of the other reasons behind a wait and see approach. Um, just to be completely upfront and transparent with everyone, I am happy to go to the board with whatever message you would like me to take. That is my job in this process. 
but I do also want to be upfront and honest with everyone about what the reality this year for all of the reasons I've shared may be in actually getting a reduced cap. Sarah? Yes. Is property tax a primary source of revenue for the county? It is, and we have a very low, I mean, for those of you guys that maybe have homes in different areas, you know our property tax rate is pretty low. And um, it's my understanding that without, again, taking that to the voters, um, or I don't know if it would be a legislative action at the state level, we cannot change that number, that percentage. Yeah, it's very difficult to do, and it's yeah. a very slow item to respond to changes in the economy as well. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, but, but you know, and Tom, thank you for bringing that up. Um, that was something, you know, I've been talking to communities about this because I think there's a larger discussion there as we move forward into the future, too, about making sure that, like, community development, that we can sustain our staffing levels you know, and others. But I think that most importantly, again, you know, we haven't fully realized the landscape that is occurring because as a result of these program changes yet, you know, and if if the we know there's still work to do, I know I still have work to do, um, but your patience and willingness to give us another year to explore those with a check-in in early 2026, I I would greatly appreciate that opportunity to to take have that time. Sarah, two yes. questions I see here. Mm -hmm. One is again from Bill Miller. Um, how would a low let's see, how would a lower cap work? Would some folks uh, you can see it lose their yeah, licenses? licenses. What just happened by attrition? Then uh, next mm -hmm. question is on commercial zone versus residential. So. Sure. So no one would lose their license. It would be attrition. Okay. So in the future, if we have this conversation and, you know, lowering the cap comes back on the table, that would not result in anyone losing their license. It would just be a slow, natural attrition. Okay. And then uh, let's see, Jean Sandlin uh, mm -hmm. said she has a question on uh, commercial zone versus residential zone. Mm -hmm. Jean, if you'd like to ask. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for all your work and all your specificity. I really appreciate it. One of the things I've always questioned um, as the program got rolled out, <clears throat> I'm a uh, owner in um, Proposal Rock Inn, okay. and I know that um, it used to be under one permit and now it's individual permits. So that's good for the county, in fact, as far as raising revenue. Um, one of the things that I've seen, though, is we are in that area, it is zoned commercial. Mm -hmm. And my question is, can we see a compromise? Because I understand the livability factor, especially those people in residential areas. But, you know, in the condo situation that was zoned commercial to begin with, and you anticipate that when you purchase a condo there, could we not lift the strict bans on that area without touching the res residentially zoned areas, it seems to be a good compromise. Um, it would help the economy in that area, keeping those um, stores and things open, you know, the Hawk Creek Cafe open that we all love and the uh, provisions open that we all love to have more people. And I've just also noticed the condos used to go like this when they went up for sale. And now it's very flat and people having to lower the prices, a lot of it because they don't have their permits. Um, mm -hmm. The sellers don't have their permits. So you could be getting more revenue, not only from more permits, but you could also, the county could also um, increase its revenue in the property tax because a lot of these condos were, you know, very low priced now they've gained price, so you'd be getting more property tax. So to me, it seems like a win-win. Um, mm -hmm. But I and I just haven't heard that be talked about a lot. Sure. No, those are all great points, Jean. I really appreciate you raising that, and I know what you've shared is on several people's minds that are on this meeting tonight. So thank you for that. Um, because our program is not 
embedded in our land use program. The zoning districts have never been considered, right? And I feel like I can confident, well, well I, I understand your logic and where you're going with that. I would be surprised if the board would consider that change on that basis while we are going through the concerns of this litigation, because part of it has been our program is not in our land use program. And that was very intentional. Um, and it, it we are going to stay the course in that. I think that what we look at in the future is in terms of livability. And if it is condo development, it could be all of the condos, irrespective of the zones that they are in. Right, because now we're talking about condo units, we're not talking about zoning. And that is certainly something that's been vetted by the group. Um, and I think we should continue to watch that to see. Thank you. Thank you. There's a couple of other questions here, Sarah. Um, let's see here. How do, how do we know that notify the county of our willingness to reduce the occupancy maximum on our home to reduce the number of parking spaces. Is that again, uh, Lynn? That is Lynn. Yes. Please okay. reach out okay. to Lynn. Okay. All right. And then uh, let's see, is there any data on occupancy rates of the dates available for existing STRs, at least in the South Beach area? It seems to me there is more vacancy than in the previous two to three years. Mm-hmm especially outside of July and August. Yeah. So, so that's, so Wayne, thank you for raising that um, point. Um, that is what we are seeing too. And what the pandemic, I think we can all anecdotally agree that the pandemic bought, brought massive influx of visitors and guests to our areas for multiple reasons. One of the things that we are tracking right now through TLT and working with Nan Devlin and others is to see if these drops that are occurring, or at least that we see anecdotally occurring, are a result of, you know, the pandemic is over, things are kind of returning to where they were, or if it is, you know, something in, you know, relationship to the economy, Inflation, we're not sure. It could be a combination of all of the above, but we are, those are one of the things that we are trying to track and determine. Um, so I don't have um, rates based on dates or seasons of rentals yet, but that is something as returns continue to come in that we are tracking as well. That again goes back to Michael's comment about all of the causes and effects. So we're trying to track as much as we can in terms of all of these these factors. Okay. Yeah. And Carlos, I appreciate what you are saying. Um, and that being proactive is always better than reactive. I agree. Um so yes, and I, I hope that your addition, you're enjoying that. So to your home. So thank you. Okay. Um, uh, one more question. When can we expect a decision on condos being exempt and what should we as owners be doing to facilitate that decision? So, yeah. Okay, great. So um, I anticipate presenting the board order with the updates, removing the program resumption lottery language, et cetera. I expect that to go forward sometime in October that will have to be publicly noticed. There is a hearing process to amend a board order or to create a new order if we're not going to do an amendment. I am leaving that to our team of attorneys to tell me how they would like to structure that. Um, there will be an opportunity for public comment during that hearing proceeding. You can also email your comments to the Board of County Commissioners. You can email your comments to Lynn and I, and I will make sure I will do a report with that order. So I am happy to add any comments to that report that will go to the board um, about a week ahead of time. So um, lots of ways that you can do that. So, and then in that order and in that process, um, if it's, 
if exempting the condos is something that the board would like to contemplate that will be discussed when that order is presented to them, that draft order for their consideration. Let's see, there's a see. comment from Bill. Bill. Some comments here, but no questions, I don't think, Sarah, for you. Okay, all right. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, um, all right. So a <clears throat> uh, couple of the other things that I have to share with you. So we've talked about parking. We've talked about occupancy. We've talked about the order options. So how about, how about some hotline information and updates? Move into that here. All right, so um, again, these numbers too are changing. This is the, the, the numbers that I am sharing with you are a snapshot in time. So the numbers for the hotline are from when the hotline went, on, went into effect uh, in October of last year. Um, and we pulled this data through Labor Day weekend. Okay, so obviously it's going to continue to change. At the end of the year, I will have a final report for the Board of County Commissioners. But within that time frame, I'd like to share with you what we received. Um, I will be posting these numbers in a spreadsheet. because I know a lot of community members are interested in these numbers. Um, but there are two things that you will not see. You will not see the caller uh, or uh, concerned citizen contact information and name. So there will be no identification. Um, anything that is complaint driven or related to enforcement, <laughs> bless you, in our office, we do not disclose the names of those concerned parties. Um, the other thing that you will not see is the specific address of the property that the complaint is related to. What I hope to do is to use this as information that we can all find helpful and to use this data in a manner that does not vilify community residents and concerned citizens or the owners and operators of a property. Not all complaints are violations. And so I think that for all of us, the most helpful thing that we can do is look at the data itself. Um, it varies through communities. So I can share with you tonight, all of the communities, if you're interested um and give you some numbers so within that time frame roughly 312 complaints were received countywide from october through labor day weekend any guess on who had the highest number anybody want to guess everybody's gotten it right so far the village pacific city Really? Yeah, Pacific City, of those 312, 82 of them were in Pacific City Woods. So the hoodlums hang out. Yeah, and well, so part of that, um, one of the things that I think has been helpful is where we are seeing the same property resurface on a weekend or a regular basis not all of those 82 complaints were related to 82 different rental properties. Um, most of them are isolated areas in Pacific City Woods. Um, Nescoin had 34. Ninety-five of those complaints were actually inquiries. So almost a third of the total number filed were more inquiry related. How do I pay for my license? Can I get a license? What are the parking requirements? Um, the dogs jumped out of the window of a rental and I don't know what to do. Um, we are watching people take the furniture out of the home and pack it down onto the beach and take photographs on the couch. Um, it's the smoke detector won't stop going off. I can't get into the rental. So there's just been this hodgepodge 
of different calls that have also come through that line. So 95 of the 312 were not actual complaints, inquiries, comments. Um, with that number, I would say too that some of them, what the hotline has turned into is a form of communication. I have seen owners and operators who have responded to a concern or a complaint call the hotline and specifically leave me a message saying, Sarah, we took care of it. So um, that has occurred. Manzanita uh, in their UGB, they had four calls. Nia Connie had 14. Neatarts had 15. Oceanside had 13. Rockaway UGB had three. So the properties in the urban growth boundary, 16 of those were us testing the hotline when we were getting it online and up and running. Tierra Del Mar had 26. And again, those were largely area or property specific focused. Um, the primary, so like the top, the top reasons for the complaints were parking, trash, and fireworks. Um, I will say with the trash and the parking, I think a lot of the calls and complaints that were filed could have been avoided if people had bear proof garbage cans, they had a better garbage can. I think we've all, you know, seen even with people trying, like the critters are still getting into the trash. Um, and then, you know, people just not either knowing or caring about where they're parking and seeing a lot of rentals who even after their renewal process have more than the allotted number of vehicles at a rental. And so one of the things that I hope to do moving forward, and I've already talked to a few of our managers and owners is kind of, you know, is there a way that we can have stronger engagement or interaction with guests? Because I think a lot of the calls that we've received and complaints could be avoided with stronger communications of expectations and understanding of the rules before guests get here. Um, what else do I have in here? A couple of questions, yes, Sarah. Please, okay. yeah, let's take time for uh, questions. Yeah, for, from Hillary for the 34, for the 34 complaints over the year in Neskewin, mm -hmm. how many resulted in violations mm -hmm. is a question? Yeah, that's a good question. So that um, actually leads into the next piece of this. So um, not all complaints are a violation. And one thing I will say is that I get a lot of complaints without evidence. And for those two reasons, there have not been many violations issued. And I would say for Neskowin, I have not issued a violation letter to date. That doesn't mean that I won't, but it just means to date I have not. Um, what I also know, and this may be true in Neskowin as well, is that there are a lot of neighbors that instead of calling the hotline, call the manager or owner or operator directly when there's an issue, which I think is fine. However, if the most important function of the hotline for some people is that data gathering to really assess, fully assess complaints and the number of complaints in terms of livability issues, I need folks to call the hotline. Um, in the ordinance, there is a requirement that the owner or operator maintain their own complaint log that I can ask for. I'm not sure folks are doing that. If you are, thank you. Um, but to gather comprehensive data, if that's what matters to communities, I need people to call the hotline. Um, on the other hand, if what is more important to the community is to get a timely response and get those issues resolved when they occur at a property, 
If you want to call the owner operator directly, that's fine. The ordinance does say that the complaint should go through the hotline. I believe the word shall is there. But I understand like, you know, again, for me, it's being able to quantify and accurately assess complaints, see how we can help better address community livability concerns. And if people are surprised by that low number of complaints, it's because that's all I've gotten. Along those lines, Sarah, do these numbers include the website complaint forms? Is a yes. question. Okay. Yes, it's all of them. Okay. So I know who called versus who submitted a complaint. And, you know, I've made a few calls. I will tell you that if I'm seeing something chronic, evidence or not, violation or not, <clears throat> complaint related to the ordinance or not, because not all complaints that come in are regulated through or the or short-term rental ordinance either. Um I will tell you that I will reach out to those owners or operators and say, hey, I'm getting calls about your pro one of your properties. And I, you know, I want you to know because if there's a way to avoid this in the future, we're we're trying to do, we're trying to work together to keep this program going and going at a, you know, level that the, you know, that wow. is we want a healthy industry. And um, you know, kind of please help me address and resolve these continued complaints for this property. Yeah. Okay. Just another question here. You can price it, but is your complaint data available for public review? Specifically, can a community assist in addressing issues locally without needing county action? I think is the. Yeah. Thank you, David. I really appreciate that question. Um, so yes. Yeah, so the data that I'm sharing will be posted. Like I said, I'm taking out specific property addresses. I'm taking out caller or, you know, filer identification. Um, so what you'll see is in each area, the number, and then I've categorized those into what the complaint was related to. Um, you know, I know um, in Tierra Del Mar, there's a couple of STR operators who are getting together to work with the community on ways to reduce speed on roads because one of their top concerns for livability issue in Tierra Del Mar is how fast people drive down their streets. Mm -hmm. And there's owners and community members getting together to actually address that. So yes, yes, I think there's a lot that can be done that would make a meaningful difference without the county yes. having to get involved yeah. or if you want my support, I'll be there. Jean has another question. Was there a data dis or a date distribution frequency? For example, at a 34 would, you know, uh, I guess what percentage were during the 4th of July is a question. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, I do have that. 4th of July was, as folks would expect, one of the busiest weekends for calls. Um, so yes, I can add that as far as the frequency. So you can see um, one thing that I did do occasionally over the summer was on Friday, Saturday, and Sundays in the evenings, I jumped in my car and drove around. Did that a couple of times in Neskowin, Pacific City, Oceanside, Neocani, and just drove your streets in the evenings on the weekends to see what was actually happening. And I would leave um, around 7 p.m. thinking, you know, by then maybe the folks that are visiting for the day would be packing up and leaving so I could really drive through communities and see what was happening. Um, and I would tell you, honestly, I was actually pretty surprised at how quiet things were in several areas across the county. Um, the 4th of July, I did not go out Sunday night. I went out Saturday night. And Sunday night was when most of the calls came in. So I picked the wrong day that weekend. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll add the, the frequency so you can see that. Then Harvey has a question. That, uh, data required in sign is op owner, op owner op slash operator. So how would people know the hotline number? Ooh, that's a good question. Thank yeah. you, Harvey. Okay. So part of the 
updates for this renewal process is when you are at your anniversary month for renewal, you have to now have the hotline number on your sign. And your sign has to be readable from the road right of way. So folks should, you're not going to see, not all the signs are updated because not everyone is through their renewal process, right? But again, by the end of this year, everyone's sign should be updated to have that hotline number on it. The hotline number is also on the community development homepage. So you can, you can also get it there. Okay, and just a question from my or comment from Michael. Boy, you have to lubricate the the bear proof cans oh, to man. make make sure that they're not not latching, not not latching. Yeah, no, it's it's a real thing. And I would, and you know, and here's well, the other thing I would really I would sh share with folks. Just I did receive some photos of trash um, with some complaints, but unless I can see, like. If I get a photo of trash on the ground, it could be anybody's trash, right? Like I gotta, I gotta be able to have a clear photo or something that can confirm who or where that trash belongs. The other thing I would say in some of the follow-up phone calls that I did do with trash, some of the issues with trash were not from the guests. It was from the, the owners or family members that were staying at the property. So not renting people. It is their property and trash services on Wednesday. They're leaving Sunday and they're putting their own trash out on a Sunday when they leave. And it's sitting out there until the garbage service comes on Wednesday. That again, that's I, I understand, but like that is that's not helping us as we try to work through this program and address livability concerns. So I would just please ask if, if there's a different way to do that. I understand you don't want your trash sitting in your garage, but like trash is just an issue anyway for everyone. Yeah. Oh, I didn't hear what you said, Mark. You're on mute. Sorry, I, I think that's it in the chat. There are some comments, but okay. uh, in terms of questions, I... Okay. So um, those are really my updates uh, for today. Um, thank you. So yeah, I would love to know. So now that I've shared all that, I would love to know from the community's perspective, how do you think it's gone this summer? Are you starting to see or feel some changes in terms of a lesser impact of community livability issues because of maybe some of the changes that are starting to roll out through this program. I know there's still room for improvement. I got a lot of work to do, but just what we've been working on, is anybody like, is it, are, are things like parking better? Are they worse? Are they the same? What What are you seeing out there? I'm looking for people that are raising hands. There's quite a few here. So great. Okay, I'm going to grab you, my pen. You, but I don't start taking I don't notes. See any, I don't see any raised hands or um, any comments from anybody. You can feel free to speak if you have a comment. I can't find their hand raiser. So I'll okay, speak. okay, there you go, <laughs> Sarah. I'd say my only complaint, and I don't know, and I don't know if they're going to be pinned on SDRs, fireworks. I would like to blow people up with fireworks. I know that's kind of extreme, but I'm sick and tired of them. I mean, they're everywhere. They're on the street. They're on the beach, and then they, of course, they leave them on the beach. But well, I mean, the trash is yeah. the trash, and honestly, I think. Um, even the, like you mentioned the cans getting pulled out earlier, as long as the latches work on the cans, the, the bear had a heyday um, around our, our place last night. <laughs> um, They're all tipped over and the one he got into was the one where the latch wasn't working, right? So that, that's that's fine. I get why people put it out and stuff. And again, as long as the can works, it's it's fine. But the fireworks and it's, it's I know it's an impossible uh, item to enforce, 
Um, but that's the one single thing I would say. I, I do have to say, I seem like, it does seem like it's better with parking uh, mm -hmm. and occupancy. And, and we have a unit that's near us that's famous for uh, attempting to set the Guinness World Record for the number of human beings who could be stuffed into one structure. But um, it's better. <laughs> and so and I appreciate it. Appreciate the work that you do and the group's doing and the owners try to do. So um, I know for me, it's the one thing it's fireworks. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. And thank you, Nancy and Wayne. Um, fireworks is the top issue I'm hearing in every community. So Michael, you're not wrong. And there's a lot of people that share your feelings. I think we can all tolerate it through the 4th of July weekend, right? But it's like, there's a point before it and after it where like, when, when does it end? And then a lot of people are bringing up, you know, fire risk concerns. And I don't know, I think that's a bigger issue than the short-term rental program. I think as a county collectively, we have got to figure out a way to try to address those concerns and the well, safety I, concerns that go with it. I spent 40 years in the fire service. So yes, right. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm pretty aware of what fireworks do. And I think we've been fortunate. I mean, this village is filled with homes with, you know, Cedar, cedar sightings and yeah. everything in between and pine needles all over the place. And so I think we've been pretty fortunate that we haven't had uh, something happen. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you. There are some other comments. Uh, <laughs> Candace, I think Candace said that owners seem to be more compliant than previous years. Uh, parking in South Beach is definitely better with fewer cars from Wayne. And Bill Miller, uh, how do you want us to let you know? And I think you know, Bill, you can put something in the chat or you're free yeah. to speak if you'd like. Is there going to be a formal vote? I think we have a poll. Is that right, Mark, at the end of the meeting? We, we do have a poll ready to go. Hey, Mark. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Mark, ooh, yeah. um, we weren't able to put together a poll unless you were able to, um, but it, no. it, it appears that only the admin can create a poll. Uh, well, even yeah. though even yeah. though I'm the host or I've okay. been made the host, I don't have that feature available to me. But uh, an option or another yeah, solution right. would be we could we could um, um, put the the options in the, the chat for everyone to see, uh, you know, four options, and then everybody can respond to that mm -hmm. uh, with their preference. And that way we have a chat record of it. Yeah, okay. you do the thumbs that's, up. Yeah, that, that's what I meant, Chris. We have another way of doing it. We, okay. we didn't, yeah, we, we didn't have a, what we've had before, which is on the screen and the percentage and the numbers, but we can do a, yeah. a chat, chat poll, Chris, right? Yeah. So, so yes, do you, Bill, that, do, you, do you want me to present the options that were shared to you by Sarah? Or well, let's off? let's let's wait for just a minute, uh, Chris. I see some other hands raised. Um, Mark, I see Mark and Tom has a hand raised, and so Mark, uh, go ahead first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Sarah, for your time this evening. Am, am I being heard? Yes. Yes. Thank yeah, you. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Two kind of unrelated questions. Um, one on the complaints. So, you know, complaints that that actually result in violations, assuming they did. Um, mm -hmm. Does that have an ultimate effect on the renewal process of that license? Like, if you have a repeated property that that continues to have violations, it comes up for renewal. Um, is is it affected? I mean, is that something that you consider on that renewal, like potentially not renewing the license or even revoking the existing license? Yes, that can be something that is considered. Um, in that instance, I would vet that through county council. And Mark, before that would happen, that's why like, you know, I'm going to call if I'm worried about that, if I'm seeing a chronic issue, I'm going to reach out to the owner and the manager to see if something can be done. 
No, absolutely. Voluntary mm -hmm. compliance is, is always the easiest. I mean, I've been with the county out where I'm at for 23 years, so I know exactly how it works. Um, the second question I would have unrelated to that one is who performs your fire life safety inspections? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, our building division. So the okay. building division within community development. So it's building inspectors that are going out and doing the okay. inspections. Perfect. And they probably have a list of things that are important, not just from a building perspective, but to community development or or through this program that might be outside of building code. Right. So they so the so in that inspection process, so an inspection is required at the time of application mm -hmm. and then every three years. So they are verifying, you know, parking spaces and some signage you know, those other requirements when they are out there just simply because, you know, it's it's the most efficient way to do that work. Sure. Legitimate bedrooms and no one's, you know, made some, you know, off rooms that don't meet egress or not safe right. um, into uh, other rental. No, perfect. All right, All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Tom. Yeah, if if we're actually getting ready to vote, um, I want to express an opinion on behalf of uh, Save Our Neighborhoods. Um, as so, so, some of you may not know me, I'm Tom Prohodich. I'm one of the leaders of Save Our Neighborhoods, uh, which has supported increased regulation of STRs for the last three and a half years and been very much involved in the process. Um, for a lot of reasons, we've been, I wrote a, a letter in February on behalf of our group, um, which was, I partially presented in March. And um, a lot of those reasons are, are still the, uh, the rationale that we maintain, which is uh, for the present time, and we did this long before we heard from Sarah, uh, came to the conclusion that it was better to wait and see, to wait. and. I, I understand that there's a particular w issue with the condos. I wish that was easily resolvable. I think it's more complicated than simply deducting the condos, the number of STRs and the total number from the the uh, the enumerator and the denominator of the fraction and then figuring out what we've got. I think it would probably leave the rest of the village if we were going to maintain the rest of the village where we are now at about 14 or 15 percent. But if we, if we have to do this by October, uh, our position is we wait and see. Uh, there, are, there are a number of us that would like to decrease the number. And I know there are people on the other side that would like to increase the number but for a number of reasons, not all of which I'll go into now, um, but you know, uh, standing on Sarah's shoulders about the concerns that they have at the county level, uh, and also her admonition or somebody's admonition at the end of the agenda that it would be nice to come to a consensus, which to me means a compromise. Uh, I think the better position is to stay where we are for the time being and see how it plays out. Beyond that, I'll give you a few other reasons. One is the, the STR issue has been uh, in, in probably at the top of the agenda, except in the last, I would say, year and three months since July of 2023. And I give a lot of credit to Mark and the, the other members of the board that have helped maintain peace but we went through a period where that was somewhat divisive and we've had a nice cooling off period, at least in, at the community level for the last uh, 15 months, it's July when the, the rules were adopted. Uh, secondly, um, we've, got, we've got other things going on. Most importantly, the bylaws committee is still working, but even beyond that, uh, the community plan is at issue and uh, I, I, I fear that if we get into a big, uh, if it becomes acrimonious about the cap issue, which to me is the most important regulation, frankly, of all the regulations that were passed, 
if we get into a big dispute about that again, I'm afraid that that might color what happens in the community plan, plan and I fear that. Thirdly, not only is the county involved in litigation, but the, the, there's a group that is um, uh, in litigation with the county that appealed first to the Land Use Board of Appeals, then to the Oregon Court of Appeals, and now is moving toward the Oregon Supreme Court. Uh, there are 17 of us that have joined the uh, uh, the county. There, there are people from Nesquin that are on the other side. There, there are people from Nesquin that are on the county side. And uh, I don't see that. Uh, I, I think it's a mistake, and I'm a litigator. I'm not an Oregon litigator, but I, as everybody, as some people know, I'm a Texas litigator. I think it's a mistake to go too far out beyond where we are now until we have some resolution in the courts. And uh, so far, the county is one at, at county and and the intervener respondents like myself have won at the at Luba and one at the Court of Appeals, but it's never over until it's over. That That's one thing that Yogi Berra was absolutely right about. Huh. Um, and, you know, finally, you, you know, there's some of us that 21% uh, is not that bad. Uh, it, you know, there's some of us that would like it to be 15% or 16%. Uh, and I, I hope that people that feel that way will make their arguments in the future when, when this comes up at the appropriate time. And on the other side, there are people that would like it to be 20 to 25%. But we're kind of in the middle of that. And uh, I think that if Save Our Neighborhoods had its way, we would probably ask for 17 or 18 percent right now. And the other side has said, uh, Oregon Coast Host, who's leading the other side, has said in their on their website that they would like 2 percent per year, which should knock it up to 23 percent. It depends, I guess, when the year started. Maybe it's a little bit more than that. But this is a good compromise particularly given all the issues that are at the county level. And Sarah hasn't even talked about the, the FEMA train wreck that is that we're really going to have to confront that's going to come up next week. So if there's a vote for those people that that would that want to decrease, and I understand the reasons I, 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 I'm sympathetic, um, I, I would implore you to, to vote, wait and see. Um, and... Uh, and uh, but I, you know, I think if people have opinions about what it should be, obviously they should express those. That's me, but I don't want there to, I don't want there to be, I don't want there to be a vote without us having, without vetting this a little bit before we get to it. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Any other hands up or comments or I see uh, in the chat then uh, uh, thank you. Voting is needed there. I agree more. Oh, more vetting is needed. Hillary said, uh, is there any concern about exempting condos as it relates to SB 406, allowing multifamily dwellings in all zones? Mm -hmm. And as Miller says, I vote for wait and see. So maybe Hillary has a question, but yeah. if what you're trying to get to this evening, Sarah, is a, is a poll, um, I, yeah. I, uh, so, well, m maybe you can answer Hillary's question there. I, yeah, sure. Thank you, Hillary. That's a good question. Um, so let me go back up to that. Um, so the question is, is there any concern about exempting condos as it relates to Senate Bill 406, allowing multifamily dwellings in all zones? So that's a good question. Um, so Senate Bill 406 relates to middle housing uh, in residential zones. So no, there is not a concern. Um, those codes are specific in terms of up to the number of units that you know are allowed um but also it's uh they're two different programs so obviously something to keep in mind 
you know, as we look at um, the cap and the limit as we, you know, try to find ways to address our county housing needs, because some of that, you know, there's always that balance that's needed for all wants and desires for housing. Um, but I would say no, I, there, there is no concern. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, Looking forward to getting back to that project I, yeah, with you guys, I, though. I, my, my question was sort of just nuanced and just to clarify. So if somebody built like new condos that weren't in the commercial zone and condos were exempted, would those condos just be allowed to be straight up STRs or no? Well, because we don't contemplate zones, right? Zoning in our short-term rental program. They're totally separate. It's it's more about the dwelling unit versus where what zone it's located in. So if there was an exemption for all condo development, it would simply be all condos, no matter where they were located. Yeah. So that was my question then. So then would that promote building of condos in regular residential zones that could be used as STRs because they would be exempt? Potentially. That's what I Yeah. Thinking. I mean, and that's where like anticipating protection of, you know, some level of housing stock for residential housing needs in our communities moving forward, you see those protections also part of the program for limiting the number of licenses an owner can have, you know, and different things and setting those cap limits because it is a very competitive market between people who desire to have a license and those who just need a place to live and want to live here. So. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Sarah, you're probably seeing the chat. There's some that vote to wait and see and some that say just let's vote. So I don't know what you, it's, it's sort of your, Okay. Do you want to do you want to do oh, a boy. vote tonight or what, so, what, do you want, what would you like to do? Okay. So right on a bit. I yeah. think there's a couple of ways we could do this. So yeah. we can see everyone online if you go to the people button, right? So we could do a raised hands. And and if the majority is wait and see, I guess maybe what we could do is raise a hand of who just simply wants the cap lowered? If you could raise your hand, if that your preference, your number one preference is to lower the cap. Uh, Sarah, this is David Heil. Can you can you clarify the lowering of the cap versus the exemption of the condos? Because I'd like to separate those two issues if it's possible. Sure. So if the if all of the condo units were exempt then but the cap if the limit continued to apply everywhere else what we would do is out of the numerator and denominator formula right basic basic division to create that percentage is we would remove the condo units the number of units from the formula and remove them from the licenses on the other side, which as someone pointed out earlier, then would reestablish a 14, 13, 14% limit. As, as opposed to the 21% current. That's right. Okay, so so it doesn't, exempting the condos doesn't necessarily increase the cap. No, that's, it'll just reestablish what it is with that exemption. That's, that's good, I like that. Okay, so we can, so um okay oh, yes so, Wait, Mark so, oh, yeah. yeah Nancy so, do you have a question or oh, are you raising your I do I do oh, go I ahead. think it'd be helpful to understand what the questions are all going to be before we vote because mm -hmm. I guess okay. I yeah. have the impression yeah, yeah. that the main question was going to be whether we delay or not so but then okay. the first question yes. came out on how okay. we were voting if we were to vote today so yeah. I'm Thank a little you. confused okay right. Thank you. Mark this is why I should not be in part uh, in charge of this part of the process right okay so yes. I think mm -hmm. we have four options right mm -hmm. so the four mm -hmm. options are for the board to consider decreasing the cap and I think what what had come up last time is what Tom had also reflected in his comments was 
adjusting it down to 17, 18%. So that would be an option with the decrease. The other option would be to consider an increase. Third option, wait and see. Let's give it another year, see what happens. Everything freezes where it's at in terms of the number of licenses and come back January, 2026 and start talking about what's going on and how the community feels at that time. The fourth option would be to exempt the condos. So the formula would remove the condo units on both sides of the numerator and the denominator for the number of units and the number of those that are licensed and only be developed residential properties single basically it's going to be your single family dwellings for the rest of the community because i don't think you guys have much by way of licensed duplexes or triplexes so it would be it would basically adjust the cap to about 13 14 percent because all of the condo properties would be removed from the formula so those are the four options so do you want so i think chris can put those options in the chat sarah and then everybody and then, thumbs up which ones they then, want well correct and then we'll have to take some time i guess chris maybe to count them and or and so that we come out with a result this evening uh okay. chris can you could, could i just yeah say one other thing yeah um, go ahead to me the the big question that the others are kind of hinging on is the question of whether we wait a year can you just move or, yeah. sure and so if we're if we're going to vote to wait do we care about any of the other questions if ever because i'm seeing in the chat all these people saying wait they want to vote to wait. Yeah. so I, do we I, want to wait and see and then we have data on how we would vote on the other three things I and am. we're looking at those and then or or do we need to ask all four questions i'm just throwing that up thank you i i, I apologize for intervening but i i think that's where you started do you want to wait and see or not exactly yeah. that's what i was saying okay perfect yeah. let's start there yeah, I agree, sir, because if you do the other options, you're kind of gerrymandering the way certain yeah. people, they may want to have a lower one or they may want to hold it. So yeah. I think it's best just to go with, do you want to put a hole on everything? I think that's a good, good vote. That works for me. Absolutely. Just as long as, yeah, I just want to okay. make sure, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that I hear the desire for, even though the majority, I agree in the chat, mm -hmm. appears to be wait and see. I just want to acknowledge there are other opinions out there. So I'm happy to do this any way you guys want. Okay. There's two hands raised. Uh, one is Helene Koch and then Michael Beachley. So Helene. Okay. Helene. All right. I don't, uh, maybe she's just, Michael, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I, I just want to Go clarify. Um, there are two categories of questions being asked and the first category of question is whether to extend or uh, uh, that is whether to wait or whether to act if we choose whether to act then it's raise it or lower it so we're not dealing with the same category of questions with putting your hand up so i think uh, that nancy is very accurate uh the first question should be do we wait or do we act okay all right. Chris, can you put that in the chat? Uh, sure. So, so is this uh, being framed as a straw vote of those who are present today? Or is this yes. being uh, raised as a vote of the uh, village association in some way? This is a straw vote. Uh, that's the way it's being placed. Mm -hmm. um, this is not an action on the part of the membership. Um, this, uh, this is a special meeting that was designed specifically for educational and informational purposes. Perfect, okay, thanks. Okay, Chris has put it up there.
How do we do this, Chris? What's that? <laughs> How do you do? You just put your your one or two, I think, right? Yeah. You put one or two in chat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People, most of most people have already most, responded. Most people have figured it out, but not me. Yeah. <laughs> We'll be in yeah, I think you're overthinking it, Tom. <laughs> well, that's not surprising. <laughs> no, Tom, <laughs> it's not a surprise. I did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think the majority is uh, yeah, yeah. wait to see. That's what I'm seeing. Uh, Sarah, and, and those of you who set this meeting up, I, I just want to thank you on behalf of those of us who are in that condo space to keep these forums active and and often uh, as we go through this process. The wait and see seems to be the majority for tonight. Um, and it just gives us more time to better understand how this evolves. At the same time, it also gives us a chance to uh, engage more people in the awareness process. So, Sarah, I thank you personally for the time you spend on this uh, beyond the hours of your day. <laughs> and those of you who are fellow citizens here in Nesco Wynn, and some of most of you I don't know, but uh, uh, it's, it's really nice to just have this forum available. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to everyone. I really appreciate the kind words and the comments and um, it's always great to connect with you and visit with you. And I thank you all for sharing your thoughts and for your support. And let's keep checking in. Um, I'm always happy if you put a standing, you know, DCD update on the agenda for the general CAC meetings. This is something I'm always happy to report out on to keep the community updated over the next year. And then let's see what happens and um, get back to the conversation in a year. And in the meantime, when I do go to the board, if anyone has anything that they would like me to share or comments to pass along to the board, please, please feel free to email me. I am happy to do that. Thank you. Okay, Sarah, I think, uh, I think we're going to wrap this up here. It okay. looks, I think everybody's, we've got the votes. There's still some, some question, what's your email, but, um, we're going to go ahead and end this meeting. I think we've got it. Uh, it it's the wait and see. Uh, lots of information, lots of conversation this evening. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for coming tonight and uh, leading us through this conversation. So um, thank you. you have everything you need. I do. This evening? Okay. okay. I do. Thank and, you so and, much. Okay. Well, everybody, I'm going to end the meeting here and thank everybody for coming. And uh, please check the NCAC website periodically and you can see the upcoming meetings there um so everybody's invited to do that and have a good evening everybody good night thank you good night everyone take care good night. thank you sir thank night, you Mark. nice to see you michael bye. <laughs> bye tom bye guys bye kelly Thanks, bye nancy Sarah. thank you bye alex bye nancy <laughs> bye david <laughs> bye michael bye, bye tom bye bill <laughs> Goodbye, Tom boy. <laughs>